Coming up on this week in Radio Tech, Frank Martin is our guest. What an interesting person. We're going to be talking about LPFM, ATSC. Yes, I know, a lot of letter salad here. Frank and FM's The Return of AMC Quam. Well, Frank thinks so. Market size and happiness and, and, we'll finish it up by talking a little bit about Burning Man. That's coming up next on Twerks. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Broadcasters General Store with outstanding service, savings, and support online at bgs.cc. By Broadcast Bionics with the Bionics Studio, including talk show control, social media, and visual radio, Broadcast Bionics brings exceptional audience engagement to radio and TV. By Angry Audio, audio problems disappear when you get angry at angryaudio.com. By Nautel, worry-free transmission you can count on with outstanding control, reliability, efficiencies, and Nautel's unmatched 24-7 customer support online at Nautel.com. And by MaxConnect Wireless, prioritized high-speed internet service designed for transmitter sites and remote broadcasts. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech, the show where we uh, talk about everything broadcasting uh, from the uh, microphone to the light bulb at the top of the tower. And it's a, it's a really interesting episode today. Uh, I'm Kirk Harnack. I'm your host. Uh, Chris Tarr wasn't able to be with us today. He uh, usually is with us, but today we're recording on a different day than usual. And so Chris was out in the field and not able to join us. So I'm in the Telos Alliance studio, as if you couldn't tell, here in Nashville, Tennessee, very thankful to the TELUS Alliance for giving me a couple hours off on this Tuesday to do This Week in Radio Tech. And, uh, of course, I work for them, so if I say nice things about TELUS Alliance, well, that, you know, that's not the only reason why, but that, that's certainly part of it. All right. Uh, we're glad to have you along. This is the show where we do talk about engineering things in mostly in radio. But we've got some television to talk about today and a very interesting intersection of television engineering and radio engineering. And I'm delighted to introduce our guest, a fellow that I've known for some years on Facebook, but finally got to meet in person a couple of weeks ago. And that is Frank Martin. He's an L.A. broadcast engineer. Hello. Frank, welcome in. Hi. How are you doing? Okay. We're here at you, uh, KQB. Yeah, I'm here at a little low-power FM in downtown Los Angeles. Uh, I'd say the call letters stand for Queen of Boyle Heights, and the Queen would be Carmelita Ramirez Sanchez that runs this place. But anyway, we're in the main air studio for this at KQBH LP 101.5 in downtown LA. Good deal. Good deal. Frank, uh, give us the elevator pitch on your career. We'll go into more detail, but you know what what, what does Frank Martin have to do with broadcast engineering? Uh well, right now, I'm uh, taking care of uh, two AMs and their FM translators in Palm Springs, these two LPFMs. And uh, in uh, the past decade, uh, I, I built the MeTV with uh, Press Communications, uh, RF Channel 3, and uh, uh, and I could go on to 1970 back from there. So. <laughs> Well, suffice to say, you've got experience in radio and television. You did work uh, just literally up the road from Nashville, Tennessee, in in Bowling Green, Kentucky, for a while, didn't you? WNKY, NBC 40, a little gig. They needed a chief engineer to I had the Athens Olympics in 2004. We got on the air in Bowling Green as NBC affiliate. They're NBC and CBS now, I think. Uh, Rick Mitchell's up there doing that now, if Rick ever sees this. Hi, Rick. And uh, yeah, it uh, that was 2002, uh, two, three, and four, and I got a call in 2005 to come back here and create a Franken FM uh, for uh, Los Angeles. Well, Franken FM is actually one of our topics we're going to be talking about. Uh, in fact, coming up on the show, uh, Frank Martin and I are going to be talking about fr- uh, the LPFM window. Um, Frank's got some interesting ideas about ATSC 3.0 and how that impacts radio and and how it's impacted or not impacted much uh, in television. Frank and FMs, as Frank mentioned, uh, maybe a return of CQAM. There's some interest in in AM stereo via CQAM. Hey, I put a couple of CQAMs on back in the day. Uh, Also, Frank has some interesting thoughts about something with our careers as engineers having to do with market size and the level of happiness. And I I think this is a really important point to talk about. So I'm looking forward 
to that. So all that's coming up. Hey, our show is brought to you in part by Nautel. And as usual, Nautel is doing some Transmission Talk Tuesday roundtable discussions. Now, to find out about those, you go to a website. You go to nautel.com slash webinars. And even though these these roundtable discussions are not specifically webinars, they are, in fact, discussions. And there's a, there's a guest or two. Uh, Jeff Welton hosts them, but you get to participate if you want to. You can submit a question beforehand. You can raise your hand during the the roundtable discussion and uh, ask a question live. You can even tell your side of the story if you've got some information to add to this. Just today, July 18th, the day that we're recording this torch show, uh, they talked about combiners and filters. That show uh, will be available soon on the Nautel website. Um, but coming up August 1st, here's what you want to register for. The topic is what's up with EAS? What's up with the emergency alert system? And ask, we're asking that question because there's got to be some changes afoot. Uh, EAS has long been I personally think, you know, you know my opinion, maybe you do, uh, mired in rather old-fashioned distribution and technology. And, of course, we want it to be reliable. And some people argue, well, hey, what, we, what we're doing is reliable. I would argue, no, it's not. Look at all the times that it doesn't work. Uh, you know, we're much more able to get the top-of-the-hour uh, national news on the air than we are an EAS message. So um, anyway, we're going to talk about that, uh, or they're going to talk about that. Jeff Welton and his guests will talk about what's up with EAS, what changes may be afoot, and with more broadcasters being having central locations, either regionally or nationally, you know, uh, and some of them do a really good job of handling EAS alerts, even for their individual markets. And we want to see if the FCC rules maybe could change to accommodate uh, that kind of operation. All right, so check it out, nautel.com slash webinars. Thanks, Nautel. All right, uh, Frank Martin is my guest, and Frank, I may accidentally call you Francis Martin. That's your Facebook name. Uh, you go by That's Frank. My to your driver's license name. If you're a bill collector, license. the IRS is what you're going to call me. Yeah. <laughs> let's uh, let's. You know about LPFMs. You're at one right now, and uh, KQBH. Yeah. Um, talk to me about the LPFM window. That's something that I don't know much about. I just haven't been much into LPFMs. Uh, what, what's if it about? you want to file and, and apply for an LPFM, I. I We'd have to Google and look up the dates, but there's a window coming up very shortly, and you need to do it. Uh, LPFMs, of course, are restricted to uh, 100 watts, and uh, the reach is maybe a 10-mile circle, if you're lucky. Uh, and uh, it's, it's an exciting thing for a lot of people who want a radio station. And they're non-commercial. They have to be non-commercial. Uh, there are people uh, so that what operate non I'm sorry, what, what does that imply for what kind of organizations typically are going to apply for and run an LPFM? And maybe what organizations should not even bother? I think anyone can. If you want to have a commercial station, you can run a uh, LPFM and you just say you're doing underwriting or supporting, just like PBS does. The, the, the line between commercial and non-commercial has gotten so blurred over the years, especially in the LPFM. Uh, there, there's people that run LPFMs that sound just like commercial stations. There's one out here in the Inland Empire, KQLH, and there's one in the uh, Cajon Pass north of Los Angeles in uh, uh, Castaic. And, and that sounds like a commercial country and western station. Uh, but, you know, there's little things you can't mention prices for things. Uh -huh. You have, uh, you know, underwriting instead of sponsorship. But Still, they operate like commercial stations. This one we're setting at here right now, that we're in the control room. That's that's a Wheatstone, Wheatstone Lightning Board. And uh, it's uh, uh, this one operates as a regular non-commercial type of operation, KQBH here in Boyle Heights, Los Angeles. Uh, it is uh, at the Boyle Heights Arts Conservatory from out. Uh, which is a arts and performance venue that's been around since the, the late 30s uh, here at Cesar Chavez and Soto, which is a little like Mexico City, but a lot like uh, Los Angeles. So, uh, <laughs> gotcha. If you want a little radio station, an LPFM might be for you. You can make it like a commercial station. You can make it like uh, uh, this one, a non-commercial station. This one is block programmed by local volunteers that come in and do an hour. And they filled it up with uh, people that just want to be on the radio for fun and excitement. That's that's how this non-commercial station is done. 
the one, uh, the country station in Castaic uh, is, uh, is a robot that just plays country music and, and has local underwriters. And uh, it's, that's run in that manner. So I, I don't know, you'd have to want to be on the radio and have a radio station. That's the main criteria. <laughs> I don't know what else would prohibit you from doing it other than the daunting task of getting FCC license. And this one here is time shared with others. We're here at, uh, it's two in the afternoon, 2.12 uh, Los Angeles time. And this uh-huh. one is actually not on the air. The transmitter is not turned on till 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. because it's time shared with two other things on 101.5. Uh, also on 101.5 is KGB in San Diego. So it's pretty busy on that frequency here. So. Um, those are the things to know. I, I don't know how if that ha- answered your question or not. Isn't that interesting? Okay, that uh, I've I used to hear of time sharing way back in the day in the early days of radio. Yeah, I mean, uh, AM stations would time share, but these are LPFMs that are time sharing. That's really interesting. You know, I, I think uh, in downtown for, Los Angeles, you know. Anybody who's new to broadcasting or new to the difference between commercial and underwriting, generally speaking, as you said, if you're running underwriting announcements, you don't mention prices, and you typically you you don't have a call to action. So come on down today. You know you you don't say that, but you can certainly say uh, for a wide selection of used vehicles and new ones as well. Come see Smith and Jones Auto Sales. Uh, there they'd be delighted yeah. to see you, and they do carry a wide variety of of late model used cars. Yeah. You know, all factual stuff and an invitation to come down, but not a call to uh, buy your next car, you know, that kind of thing. I, I fr- Frank, I, I do want to mention, I got to spend some time with um, a, a rather famous radio programmer in Los Angeles a few years ago, uh, a- Andrew Jeffries. And uh, I guess he's still with iHeart. I, d- I don't know for sure. But I got to spend some time with Andrew Jeffries, and he owns some radio stations in New Zealand. And they're commercial stations, but he runs them all very simply, and all the commercials kind of just sound like underwriting announcements. Uh, and there's very few updates, you know. Hey, this hour of music brought to you by Bud's Coffee Shop uh, down in the valley. Come, come see Bud's for the best uh, cup of Java and blah blah blah. Uh, and and so radio can work that way. It's an it's a different and interesting model, but it, it can work that way. Not that LPFM is the same thing, but uh, it, it's it's not an un, unusual model. You don't have to have eighteen, you know, or twenty one commercial minutes every hour, all screaming at you to come, you know, get your furniture or, or your car, do you? <laughs> no. So, uh, if I, uh... if someone. If someone wanted to see, let's assume a, a newbie is uh, Googled and found this episode of this show with the search term LPFM, what, what, is a, what does a lay person do to find out, can I even get a channel where I live? Uh, do, you, do you see a consultant? How does that work? Well, that's one way. One of the great consultants that helped with this is Pete Trittish in Philadelphia. And, and that name is a play on words, Petri Dish. His name is Petri Dish, Pete Trittish, T-R-I-D-I-A. And, and uh, uh, he's uh, Alan Korn up in Berkeley. Uh, those are some great people to have on your side and, and resources for LPFM. And, and there's some technical um, uh, uh, yeah. progressive concepts is a place that sells equipment for LPFM. It seems like, is, is, the, is there an organization called Prometheus that's, that's still doing things that's with right. LPFM? Pete Trittish. Prometheus is Pete. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, boy, I had some people from that organization on uh, this show years ago. Let me see if I can find a, uh, a link to that show or to their website, uh, their organizational website. And uh, so if people are interested in that, um, any, can, can we move on to a different topic? Yes. Okay. ATSC 3.0 television. Uh, you know, when, when we moved to ATSC 1.0, digital TV, DTV, um, and people associate that with HDTV, it, it didn't have to be, but for the most part, it is. Um, that was a big thing uh, back, gee, 20 years ago or so, and now it's uh, it's almost all that way. Um, ATSC 3.0 was supposed to the bring us into some... Analog. Yeah. Shut off your analog. Uh, what what was ATSC supposed to do, and uh, in your opinion, what isn't it doing? 
uh, it promised 4K TV. You can do 4K TV. ATSC 3.0, uh, the throughput of ATSC 1 is 19.39 the megabytes per second. ATSC yeah. 3 is variable. Yeah. You can have as little as 1 for a big coverage area with lots of forward error correction is how it does that. And and you can have as, as much as 56 megabytes per second. The sweet spot seems to be around 26, 27 megabytes per second. And uh, that's uh, what the Fox one here in Los Angeles is running at, and uh, most Franken FMs. So uh, because of that extra bandwidth and because of the multiple layers of uh, of, of progressive degradation, it, it, it can support the 12 megabytes a second you need for 4K. Maybe some codecs have it down less. It supports all co codecs. It supports internet protocol. Um, I could go on and on uh, about all of the glorious uh, advancements in technology. It's in its box, that is a set-top box for ATSC3. It sells for about mm -hmm. 250 bucks, has an HDMI output. Um, and, uh, that's the only way other than buying a new $700 Sony TV or Sony or uh, LG, uh, it, most of them Costco incorporate ATSC3, which is labeled by the way, next gen TV, look for the next gen yeah. TV logo. Yeah. And, uh, that's what it'll be. So, so that's the positive side, but what has surfaced in the past? Well, since the beginning of the year, at the beginning of the year, um, there was a subscription-based encrypted ATSC3 uh, network in Boise, Idaho, called Evoca, E-V-O-C-A. And uh, they completely went bankrupt and failed. Uh, in my opinion, over the decades, it seems that every single subscription-based attempt, whether it was adult content or, or uh, on TV or movies or whatever, has failed. Ivaca, looking at they had, they were of course uh, out in Boise, uh, close to the uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. So they had uh, Brigham Young University TV was their main unencrypted channel, and the other things they had on them were uh, Bloomberg, uh, 4K Channel, Game Show Network, the Mavericks uh, Sports Network, the Cowboy Channel, the Outdoor Channel, Weather Underground, Cars TV, Root Sports. That was, and they combined that. They packaged it with everything else that was. Uh, on uh, uh, broadcast into a little set-top box I sold you for 25 bucks and 25 bucks a month, but it was a dramatic failure, unfortunately, uh, uh. and uh, went completely bankrupt in January. And, and uh, but that was a test bed for uh, encryption. And what is happening now with ATSC3 is all of the broadcast stations, Channel 13, the ABC affiliate, uh, I think it's KNTV in Las Vegas, encrypts their ATSC3. So nobody can see it. Nobody can see it. It comes up with a saying, mm. this is not available on your channel. And, and why would anyone do that? Well, they uh, want to secure their stream. They want to secure their content from internet uh, rebroadcasters like Flickstore.to and things like that. But that's not the real reason why. The real reason why is they want to collect more retrans fees. They want people to pay for their service. And, and it's about 14, 12 to $14 billion a year that go to uh, broadcast stations from uh, cable and satellite providers in retrans fees. So yeah. they feel like if they can get all of broadcasting be turned off and not be free anymore, and if they can encrypt, uh, which they are doing, certainly on Channel 3, 13 in Las Vegas that I saw last weekend when I was there. Uh, it's, it's a very dark thing. I think uh, it could signal ATSC3 being the end of broadcast TV as we know it, free over-the-air TV. So, wow. Uh, wow. I, 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 are, I, and are, are they sad. not recording? If they're licensed by the FCC, are they not required to provide a free service for which they're licensed? Yeah, you'd think so, huh? And someone needs. Yeah, to yeah. I mean, I, 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 I get the retrans fee. Hey, let me let me tell you, um, my, some of my radio stations are in Greenville, Mississippi, little small town, not heavily populated, and yet right, a couple right. different companies have paid a lot of money for the two network affiliates in Greenville, Greenwood, Mississippi, and when asked when we found out why would you buy these these stations when you have very little commercial revenue and, and not a big audience uh the answer was 
retrans fees. We right out of the gate, we got it was something like six hundred thousand dollars a month in retrans fees from the various cable companies. And so that they, they the company that bought these commercial TV stations in Mississippi bought it for the retrans income. Isn't that interesting? And there you are. Uh BYU's attempt, excuse me, uh, Ivaca in Boise, Idaho, they, they mm -hmm. did keep the BYU channel, the Brigham Young University channel, free uh, and encrypted everything else. Uh, I rather imagine that when this comes before the commission, they will say you have to have one channel free, and that's what they'll do. I, I, yeah. I don't yeah. But right now, wow. channel 13 is encrypted in Las Vegas. There's no receiver that can get it unless they can figure something and ship it to your cable head at. Wow. ATSC3. Wow. Hey, we're talking to Frank Martin, Francis Martin. He is uh, a Los Angeles based broadcast engineer, does some consulting too. Um, and we're talking to him on this week in Radio Tech. We're going to have some topics coming up, including Franken FMs. Uh, you've heard of those before. We're going to hear more about that coming up. Also, a return maybe of CQAM. I kind of like CQAM. And uh, market size versus happiness as in our careers as broadcast engineers. That's that's coming up, and I'm sure a couple more topics as well. Our show this week in Radio Tech is brought to you in part by Angry Audio ang at angryaudio.com. Let me show you this. This is cool, and i got to tell you about this um, uh, this audio console from Angry Audio. It's the new Rave console. Now, it's purely analog. Rave is the new radio mixing console from Angry Audio, up to eight stereo line inputs, up to four mic inputs, two output mix buses, two mix minus outputs with talkback, flexible monitoring for board operator, uh, monitor feed to studio guests with talkback, and automatic monitor muting, of course, when the mics are open, because it's a broadcast console. Crystal clear metering and tallies are shown, and the control surface is machined and anodized aluminum. It's gorgeous. The markings are all laser etched so as to never wear out. Really easy installation. Now, remember, this is not a digital console. It is purely analog. If an analog console is what you need, you don't need it networked to the rest of your system, this may be for you. Uh, it has a built-in power supply, no wall wart, uh, mic and line remote logic, warning and user tally outputs for lighting your on-air signs and enunciators. Uh, it has preview on every channel, very silky smooth faders, avionic style switches with LED illumination, sleek low-profile desktop design, and I click the update link at the bottom of the page. Oh, I'm sorry. That's the, I'm reading. I'm reading the wrong thing. <laughs> That's the rave console. I'll get that right next time. Uh, from Angry Audio. Check that thing out. It is so cool. And they'll be shipping that in just a couple of weeks if they aren't already. That is, it is so. I got to see uh, an early one uh, back a couple months ago. Thanks a lot, Angry Audio, for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. Also, our show is brought to you in part by the Max Connect Group. And Suncast, I, I think I may have mentioned to uh, play a little thing from Gary Morrill, if you would, please. I'm Gary Morrill, Midwest Regional Director of Engineering for Alpha Media. When I first spoke with Josh Bone about Max Connect, he told me they'd work great for remote transmitter sites where connectivity was a challenge. And you know, he's absolutely right. We even have sites where we're using this as a backup to our STL using Max Connect's dual carrier option, and it works perfectly. We also have times where we need to be able to get out to a venue where it's kind of challenging because everybody and his brother is trying to stream video at the same time, like at a big sporting event. And you know what? Our data gets through every time because it's prioritized packet data. It works for us. It'll work for you. Max Connect. Check it out. This is an awesome, awesome service. Thanks, Josh Bone at Max Connect for figuring this out. And you should know that Max Connect Group uh, is doing some new things here in 2023. Uh, Josh has expanded the company. They can help you, help you engineers with uh, projects. Maybe you don't have time to do. Maybe you got too much going on. Maybe you want to make sure it's done right, and you just don't have time to do it right. Uh, they have uh, tower services coming along, uh, automation, installation, and setup, transmitter side upgrades. Uh, they'll install transmitters, carry away the old one for you studio construction both analog and aoip uh, nrsc measurements you know you still may need to do those uh, due diligence inspections are you buying a station selling a station that kind of thing and you know what a lot of us need grounding updates we need to get a better ground system in or 
uh, and inspect our ground system, just make things. And some of that stuff is hard to do. Well, Max Connect will do those things for you. Check them out at maxconnect.com. The link is in the show notes. Thanks a lot, Josh Bone, for your service and for uh, sponsoring This Week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack in the Telos Alliance studio here in Nashville, Tennessee, and my guest is Frank Martin. Uh, Frank is an engineer in the Los Angeles area, and uh, I got to spend some time with Frank a couple weeks ago here in Nashville at the Skirmerhorn uh, Symphony Center. And then uh, later on, we uh, we got to sit down at, at a bar and, and uh, have a drink and get to talk about engineering. So, uh, Frank, I really appreciate the opportunity to get to, to meet you in person. Uh, Frank and FMs. This has always been a little bit interesting, uh, I think. Frank and FMs. For those who don't know, Frank, what's a Frank and FM? Oh, that name was coined by uh, the uh, newsletter uh, operator here, uh, the Bob Gonsett, the Bob Gonsett CGC communicator. And, and oh, yeah, uh, it's, it's it's a divisive thing that you either they're pirates, <laughs> they shouldn't exist, or 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 maybe you're an alternative uh, hippie here and and think that they should all exist. And the alternative hippie that started it was uh, Jeremy Lansman. Frank and FMs back in Alaska uh, in the 70s. And uh, Mike Cousins was the uh, champion of them that I, I sent you a piece that Mike Cousins wrote about the history of Frank and FMs and Jeremy Lansman in mm -hmm. Alaska. Jeremy had uh, a station later in, uh, before that, KFAT, KFAT 94.5 in Gilroy, the garlic capital of California. And uh, uh, He's very innovative. Jeremy's in South Africa right now, uh, being a successful expatriate. And uh, so uh, he, he, he started this ball rolling. rolling and uh, right now, thanks to Well Venture Technology Group, uh, Larry Rovo here in Los Angeles, who brought me back to Los Angeles to do the LA Franken FM uh, from Bowling Green, uh, and uh, about a dozen other people. There's 13 Franken FMs on the air right now. They exist okay. uh, as, as temporary things. You have to, six months at a time, you have a waiver. And every six months, you have to get your waiver, your special temporary authority renewed. Until such time as the notice of proposed rulemaking on what they're going to do or they're going to make them legal uh, or, or what uh, will be decided by the commission in the year or two ahead. NPR is profoundly opposed to them. Because you know they can't have anything but NPR below ninety two on the FM dial, and uh, in, in spite of the uh, one of the other origins was our friends at the Pacifica Foundation, and they're they're for them. You know? So there's there's NPR, there's the commies, and there's the NPR people, <laughs> and all fighting over uh, what it should be. Here's some uh, logos of some. Uh, here's here's the graphics. I'll hold my phone to the screen. This is a big one in Chicago. Okay. Uh, you know, me MeTV FM with Weigel Broadcasting. Uh, that's a great little dance one in uh, Las Vegas that uh, I really enjoy when I'm there. Holly Adams, who I worked with at Mars FM in uh, huh. 92, uh, is the voice of Acid FM, K KGHD. Let's see, there's another one in uh, the one I put on the air here is Radio Guadalupe, which is. Uh, there's Jewelry TV on the main one and Radio Guadalupe, which is a Hispanic church. And there's the other two ATSC3s here in Los Angeles, which are on RF channel uh, 13 right now. But, uh, oh, and in your part of the world, over in uh, Memphis, can you see that? Yeah. No? Bumpin'. Bumpin' 87.7. Yeah, bumpin'. There it is. That's in Memphis, Memphis, Tennessee. So there's yeah, one yeah. in Tennessee. How about that? And... Uh, so there's 13 so, of them. Uh, now, we'll just to make sure I've got this right. A Franken FM is is the audio channel of an of the analog TV channel six, where, where that ought to be Historically. at 87, Historically. actually 87.75 megahertz. Right? That's correct. Okay. Uh -huh. And um, uh, but after it's all all analog television was shut off in 2009, and right. uh, after that. They got a special uh, waiver and dispensation. If they switched to ATSC three and uh, had the ATSC three signal, and ATSC three signal is flexible enough that you could carve out half megahertz, uh, five hundred kilohertz uh, for your analog FM, 
Uh, so if you if you're a Franken FM today, you're running ATSC three with some video service like it's Dia TV in Hindi language in Los Angeles. Uh, it's the uh, video side of the church, uh, the Radio Guadalupe here in here here in, in Las Vegas. It's Dia TV, and I don't know what it is in Nashville. But there there is a video component to these stations, uh, but, huh. but the reason they really exist is for the audio station, the analog FM that's in that eighty seven seven. Wow. Are you confused oh, okay. yet? Well, uh, no, it's, you know, I, I don't have one near me to listen to, although I've heard about them for years. And every once in a while, Radio World magazine will will have some article about this. I remember reading about them literally years and years ago. Uh, in fact, we had a right. guest on our show uh, some time back. I want to say Nick, Nick Straka uh, may have been involved with a, with a Franken FM or helping them out or that, that kind of thing. So, um, it, it, what, what do you think is going to happen to to that area, I think can we keep? Be legitimate. I, I think that unless the FCC is totally corrupt, and there's some debate on that or not, I think yeah, that there'll be yeah. some legitimacy yeah. given. I hope that they'll be legitimized and grandfathered in, and continue to exist. Uh, otherwise, there will be NPR will ram through their agenda, and their agenda is to wipe all other broadcasters off of the dial under 92 that are not NPR. I, I, I yeah. don't think uh, yeah. it, it depends on who is holding the political power uh, at the commission. And uh, hopefully they'll be grandfathered in and legitimized after this notice of proposed rulemaking completes. That's that's just my hope. I, I don't know what will happen. They probably aren't long for this world. We'll find out. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. Interesting. Uh, and and I, it, does HD radio have any role whatsoever in assisting a transition from Franken FMs? Not really. I can't imagine how that would help. Now, okay. there's enough bandwidth okay. in that half a megahertz where you could run HD on your 87.7. Yeah. Uh, but uh, and if you wanted to, I guess you could do that. But they're just uh, having a hard time making it just with regular old analog right now. I would love looking. At, go ahead. Go yeah. ahead. Sorry. Yeah, go. We're looking at an HD on a little uh, uh, class A up in uh, 29 Palms in the high desert. And, and the cost of putting that in, you know, it starts at about $40,000 hmm. uh, just for the uh, basic transmitter. The yeah. uh, What are the yeah. HD components called? The... Uh, uh, the importer exporter and then the, the transmitter that'll be export that's what i'm trying yeah. to think of yeah and uh, yeah. i think we, the three people that uh, can provide them are be nautel and gates air and uh, so that's going to be ivox that i work for on palm springs is looking at that and I, they, they they will probably do that there i i don't know that it's on the radar for any of the franken fms here certainly not the mexican church here in los angeles i don't think they're thinking about it in uh, Las Vegas at KGHGLD. I think they're just they're just doing six months to six months to six months with each of their STA renewals, trying to stay on the air, and that doesn't justify you know fifty grand in outlay for HD. D does the big proliferation of streaming radio on the internet d does that reduce maybe the pressure or the need for? Franken FMs or or lots of FMs. I mean, I, I watch. Look, I'm part owner of 14 small radio stations, and um, uh, only a couple of them are are what you might call a niche format that's hard to find elsewhere. One of my stations is specifically a black gospel, very Mississippi, you know, black church gospel station. And it's the number one station in its county. Uh, its stream is reasonably popular because you it's hard to find that music anywhere else. But, you know, we also have three country stations. I mean, you can find that music lots of places. Uh, so, um, and our other stations are similarly, you know, uh, um, I wouldn't say pedestrian, but yeah, you can, you can find that stuff elsewhere, but I, streaming, uh, as hopefully internet just becomes a, a cheaper commodity that people, more and more people have access to, uh, do we, do we need Franken FMs? Um, of course, at least the question, do, do we need any FMs way in the future? How does that look? But what, what do you think of, about how streaming affects the need for these well that's the future i i i 
do we need radio? Why do we need terrestrial radio? And, you know, the first to fall is AM that you discussed a few shows ago. And, uh, uh, and, and, and do you know, well, what are young people doing and listening to? What's your average 14 year old listening to? Do they, are they even aware that radio AM or FM exists unless they were, you know, brought up in it for some way? Uh, will, will, what young people do you know and will know the magic of a crystal set and a diode on a <laughs> yeah. roll of wire on a toilet paper? And then I think these are technologies that need to be understood, but will they survive in the future? Uh, will any a radio in Europe already, in Norway, uh, and in the BBC, uh, they're just turning it off. So that, that speaks to the question of radio broadcasting in the Internet age. And, uh, my my own 12 year old son and, and he's getting in, into that age where where he could count as a consumer uh my 12 year old son um, if if it's not on this thing it doesn't exist right and that and his dad's in radio his dad you know I, i've taken him to lots of radio stations and if it ain't here it's it's not and that's why uh i don't know if it'll be by 2050 when I'm a hundred years old or, uh, or what, uh, it, it may just all fade away. It may stay. We'll find out. It, it's definitely, as you see your, your kid, what's he going to, he's, he's, is he going to be interested in AM radio? Will he be fascinated by the fact that you can demodulate WSM on a, a, a crystal set? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in interestingly, and, and this may be somewhat telling, you know, a few of my radio stations are in American Samoa. Well, uh, um, American Samoa for years has had very slow, very expensive internet. And so right. the broadcast stations and uh, luckily, thankfully, uh, the good running of them, uh, our stations are, are, are important and they're well listened to. And half the cars on the Island have our bumper stickers on them. Um, uh, so, but in other places, uh, radio plays less of a role because internet is easy and cheap and, and almost everywhere. So I, I think the availability of, of internet certainly plays into the, that equation. That, the digital divide that speaks to the question of the digital divide. Ah, and, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, Hey, uh, it's this week in radio tech. Uh, Frank Martin is my guest. I'm sorry, Frank, didn't mean to c cut you off. I'm just going to let people know again if you're just tuning in. I'm Kirk Harnack in the Telos Alliance studio in Nashville, Tennessee. We're talking to Frank Martin. He is a uh, an engineer and consultant in Los Angeles. And I see it's it's really, it, it, Frank, it's, it's time for me to take a, a quick break and uh, tell people about a piece of equipment that uh, everybody needs and you probably don't have. And that is uh, from Broadcast Tools. Uh, Broadcast Tools is the maker of, um, uh, a, well, as you know, lots of things you've probably used for years to switch your satellite receivers back when you really had to switch your satellite receiver channels. They only had one output for a while and then a couple outputs. Now they got four or so. But uh, Broadcast Tools makes a variety of gear for your studios and your studio operations or master control centers that really helps you get things done and make sure that your stations are operating. And one of those things is uh, the Audio Sentinel web rj now it's a broadcast tools next generation web enabled two channel stereo silence and phase monitor with an integrated transparent two by one switcher what does all, all that mean well it's designed to monitor two analog audio sources one primary and one backup and when silence is detected on the primary input it can automatically switch to the backup input via mechanical latching relays and they're latching that makes that, that that makes all the difference when the power goes out it includes a browser-based html5 web interface and it supports uh tls uh, email like for gmail and so forth you need to get an alert out of it yes it, it works with newer service or services that have requirements for security like gmail it also does sms email notification as well as snmp and the audio io features pluggable screw terminal blocks and standard rj45 audio jacks wired in parallel for ease of wiring now you know i, I really like the fact that don wingett has designed this and so many other of his devices to use the best technology for the application and so yeah you may think well wait a minute it's got relays in it yeah 
It's got latching relays in it, and that means that, it, but it also has a web interface. <laughs> How many devices do you know of that use latching relays and a web interface? Well, they're both important for us as broadcasters. The Audio Sentinel Plus WebRJ can be configured and monitored locally or can be configured and monitored remotely over any IP network. Um, uh, and uh, users can operate this product using a desktop web browser or mobile device. Uh, you don't need any apps from the App Store. Email and SMS notifications can be configured to alert up to eight recipients when silence or out-of-phase audio is detected. Um, it is just a cool device. Uh, oh, and SNMP traps can be set, too. So it does have SNMP built into it. That's important to folks who are monitoring a lot of things. Uh, Chris Tarr loves this thing and uh, and has has some similar broadcast tools uh, monitors at his stations. So check it out. This is for the Audio Sentinel Plus WebRJ web-based analog silence detector. This can really help you out and keep uh, keep silence from in, from being broadcast on your station. Now, where do you get these? Of course from Broadcasters General Store. BGS, the website bgs.cc. I tell you, these guys keep up with the times. They have all kind. Of, well, there's that rave mixing console we just talked about on the screen, but they have all the broadcast tools gear. There's Axia Altus. I'm fixing to install one of those in Oxford, Mississippi, in the next week or two. There's the Quasar console from uh, from Telos Alliance and Axia. Just all kinds of things from Broadcasters General Store. Now, I tell you what. BGS is good on the phones. They do good phones. So if you just want to call up, talk to somebody, get a quote, talk to a real person, not have to navigate a big IVR menu, you call them, they answer the phone. It's 352-622-7700. 352-622-7700. I love these folks at BGS. Sharp pencils and uh, good prices, and they'll tell you all about how quick they can get something delivered. Thanks, BGS, for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. All right, Frank Martin is along with us, and we've been talking about Frank and FMs, but let's move on. Um, Frank, um, CQAM, you are making this bold statement that you may be seeing, we may be seeing a return of AM stereo. And what in the heck is um, on your mind about that? It's in, in, well, maybe it has to do with me having to, I've taken over the 920 AM, little 925 kilowatt out in Palm Springs, KKGX, uh -huh. but there was a, an old Motorola CQAM generator and monitor out there. And I thought, gee, wouldn't it be nice if I could turn that on and make it work? And I did turn it on. Uh, we were refurbishing an old Continental 315 power rock that we got <laughs> from uh, K, uh, Kono, K-O-N-O in San Antonio. Uh, it banded that. They gave it to us, and uh, we're putting that back on the air. And we, we have to retune it from 860 to 920. The output of the uh, Motorola CQAM is on your frequency. You know, it has the uh, left minus right component, which is phase modulated on the carrier, and the audio that works with that comes out of it in two different feeds. And uh, uh, that's why I took an interest, because I had, had one fell in my lap. But then after looking around, I find there's a, much like there's a dozen Franken FMs, there's about a dozen stations around the uh, USA that uh, are enthusiastically promoting AM stereo. Uh, but they're all in tiny markets. Uh, yeah. Yeah. They're, they're in uh, Kingman, Arizona, is 1170, I think. And in uh, Ionia, Michigan is probably the best one, W-I-O-N. Yeah. And uh, they, their live stream, I showed that to you, Nashville was off the air off of a old Carver AM stereo tuner. And, yeah. Uh, oh, to, to, wait, to uh, take a second. Tell people about that. We were sitting at the a, bar. An old, uh, uh, I think, a Motorola. Motorola, Delta. Uh, yeah. Those are the generators that are out there now. When I was at WSM uh, out there last week, uh, happenstance, I saw their Delta in the racks. They had a couple of Motorolas. And uh, their studies say that it, it just doesn't make sense for them, that no one's really listening. That may be the case. Yeah. But if you're selling yeah. the... Uh, the owner of the stations in Palm Springs, uh, we'd like to say that he's not really selling radio. He's selling the idea of radio. And if he can uh -huh. put on his promotional uh -huh. material AM stereo like they had in 1982 there, um, that uh, it, it's, he enjoys promoting that idea. But uh, a WLS in Chicago, I believe, I don't know who they are now, at, at nighttime they were going to see Quam. Now they're talk. They were using CQAM mm. at night and HD in the daytime. 
uh, HD and AM. There's one station on in Los Angeles, 1260 in the, in the San Fernando Valley that Saul Levine runs. Uh, and uh, AM stereo, AM HD has, hasn't been a success. It's been a dramatic failure, mostly because of the interference that it produces co-channel. And uh, it might work in the daytime. It never works at night. AM HD. So AM stereo has been an interesting fallback. And the uh, in Beaumont, Texas, Chris Boone has one that he uh, has yeah. been running, I believe. Okay. So there are, there's like uh, a dozen little stations around the country. Kingman, Arizona, Ionia, Michigan, Beaumont, Texas. the AM stereo. And here's who's listening to this. Somebody with a radio from 1992 or 82? No. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have to confirm this. And uh, Jason Cooper at WSM hadn't confirmed this. HD radios, and I had a HD radio in my Prius until I traded it in a few months ago. Um, HD radios on AM, and I could listen to 1260 in HD here in Los Angeles. Uh, will decode CQAM AM stereo if the 25 hertz pilot is on. The 25 hertz hmm. pilot is optional. Yeah. It's, a, it's a button on the encoders I have out at KKGX in Palm Springs. You turn on the pilot at 25 hertz. Uh, there's some debate about uh, does it get the left and right channels right, but it allegedly, uh, just about uh, a Sanjin, most car radios, most Alpines, if the 25 hertz tone is on, it will switch in and decode CQAM on just about all HD radio receivers. So mm. that makes it a thing. <laughs> and uh, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, I don't have it on the air at 920 in Palm Springs. We would like to do it, but first we're going to get the Power Rock up and running right now. We just got the fellows to come on. Uh, a few nights ago, um, we have a gate like out there in the uh, park. I'd like to get the uh, the link uh, for listening to that the station that you uh, played oh, for me -I stream. I'm sure. Yeah, you, right you, 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 yeah, you could e email me that link, and I'll put it in the show notes. Uh, but uh, Frank played from uh, streaming a station, and the source of the stream was actually an off the air tuner. Now, those of us in the streaming know that that's typically not the best way to do it, but they're, they're making a point. The point was this is AM stereo off the air, and and the stream sounded amazingly good. I, I was pretty impressed. Okay, I'm going to mention the URL. It's okay. uh, I1430. I1, there it is. I1430.com. I1430.com. Okay. All right, cool. I will uh, put that in the in the show notes. So, um, sounds great. I, I, you know, you, you said you were alerted to something earlier about marketing and I, I gotta believe there is as much and maybe more value in just the being able to say AM stereo, whatever your frequency is, you know, W X Y Z AM stereo. Uh, it, it's, it's something that they can Detroit the, w -X -Y -Z. You know, the, the something that, the, that the listeners ears haven't been used to hearing. And so it just may be one more thing to perk people up a bit that, uh, well, anyway, it's, it's, it's use. It's, I think it's useful yeah. marketing. Yeah. You, you better be transmitting it if you're going to say it, but that doesn't mean anybody has to be able to receive it in stereo for the marketing to have done its job. Right. Yeah. Whether or not That's, it's WXYZ in Detroit or their sister station, KXYZ 1320 in Houston. Ah, there you go. Yep. I'm sorry. Um, all right. I had to go off on that tangent. Um, all right, I, I've been looking forward to this last topic, and I think it's worth expanding on just a bit. And engineers, you made a career out of broadcast engineering, radio or TV. Uh, listen up, because you well, think about the uh, think about the theme song for WKRP in Cincinnati. You know, town the to town, up and down the dial. Uh, what Dr. Johnny Fever ends up in Cincinnati? Not, not a small town at all. You know, top no. what? Top twenty, top twenty-five, top thirty, certainly Big market. Seed cities in Ohio, yeah, yeah. So uh, you, you know, we so many of us with careers, whether it's on the air, or uh, and whether it's radio or TV, 
and whether it's engineering or operations or whatever, we, we tend to desire to go to bigger and bigger stations. We tend to think there's bigger money. We tend to think there's maybe more benefits, more prestige. Uh, we tend to think that, hey, more people would rec recognize me if I was the engineer for WABC in New York uh, or KABC in Los Angeles than, you know, KBRO, wherever that may be. I'm sorry, I'm just making something up here, uh, you know, in West Undershirt, Arkansas. So uh, uh, we, we, we have this desire to get to bigger markets. That's always been a part of any way of broadcasting for many, if not most people in broadcasting. And, and hey, I've worked at the small TV stations, Greenville, Mississippi, right? Market number 210 or 208 or something. And it was just a stepping stone. Every day, every night, the reporters, the anchors were making tapes to put together their resume tape to go to a bigger market. And the only reason they were there was to make a tape to get to a bigger market. Uh, and Frank, Frank, you've got some ideas about uh, career happiness and market size. And I'd like you to expound on that for us a bit, because I, I think it's pretty smart what, you, uh, what you've told me so far. This didn't uh, dawn on me until 2012 to 2014, when I got to build the uh, uh, WJLP MeTV Channel 3 in New York City. Okay, we made it. We're in market number one. I'm on four Times Square building, uh, you know, a, a television station, and uh, it was it was a lot of fun. Uh, but I'll tell you, the SBE meetings there, uh, they'd order Domino's pizza in some conference room at United Stations Radio Networks on twenty second Forty Second Street, and it, it was the SBE out here is so much better. <laughs> I need to be a champion for LA, but. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and it was it was disappointing. I thought, this is New York. This is market number one. We're all supposed to lead up to this. And and uh, I, I love New York. I'll probably go back there for NAB New York in October and, and know a lot of great people there and had a lot of fun. But it's, uh, it's like the Peggy Lee song. Is that all there is to New York City, <laughs> to market number one? And uh, it, yeah, I... I I crawled out of personally uh, Galveston, Texas, in uh, the 1950s and 60s, and uh, we started at KTLW 920 KGBC. Keep Galveston Beaches Lean 1540. Then you go up the freeway to Houston, and then after Houston, I went to WFM Chicago, and mm -hmm. uh, then I uh, worked for Remember Circuit Research Labs, now part of Orban, and in, in, in mm -hmm. the 80s in uh, phoenix and uh, then in 1980 krq los angeles and then san francisco and then that little stint in bowling green that was fun for a yeah. couple of years and uh then got the call to do the franken fm back here in los angeles but after after actually working in new york in 2014 they thought this is what it was all about i don't know i think a lot of people are probably happier at uh, uh kbrz the breeze 1460 in uh freeport texas which was fun time I had as a kid and, and uh, also happier uh, doing whatever they were. Well, one of the things that tied me together over the years was uh, the communist Pacifica foundation in Houston. That was KPFT in Houston. You, I, do you, do you uh, know the Pacifica stations, Kurt? I, sure. I know of, of Pacifica. Sure. Yeah. There, there's five of them. There's uh, yeah. The first one is 1948 KPFA in Berkeley. And then in 1960, uh, KPFK here in Los Angeles, and then uh, WPFW in Washington, D.C. In 1966, RKO gifted them WBAI in 99.5 in New York City. And finally, KPFT in Houston, Kill Poodles mm. for Texas, the voice of uh, cosmic surrealism and godless communism for the Texas Gulf Coast. And we, we did that. Uh, and, and so I, I got tied into all of those people in, in the 70s. We went to their 50th anniversary reunion. And uh, you can you can uh, you can be happy wherever you are, just to, in that tangent. <laughs> you know, and I'm I'm glad you're bringing this topic up as I think it's terribly interesting. I, and my own observation, and, and you know, I I never dreamed of like getting a job in New York City and being there. I love visiting New York City. I just I can't imagine living there. Um, the engineering people that I've dealt with in in New York City. For me, they've typically been, you know, top of the heap 
kind of people. They're pretty good at their job, and and uh, but that that doesn't mean everybody is. But I've I've had really good experiences with New York. Uh, northeast based broadcast engineers. I, I think they're uh-huh. pretty good at what they do. I, I think there's probably yeah. some pressure to, to be really good, but that doesn't mean that I would consider being in, in New York or Chicago or Houston or oh, LA God. or Dallas as the peak of my career. Uh, I, I think there's plenty of great opportunities that are in, in smaller markets where you maybe have a more familial situation where people maybe. I don't know. I'm not saying they don't care about you in New York, but I'm saying that they certainly could care about you in markets like Bowling Green or Jackson, Mississippi or Atlanta or Dothan, Georgia or, you know, Charleston, South Carolina, which, by the way, I, that'd be a great place to live in and, and work. A beautiful place. So, um, uh, you know, or who knows? The Billings, Montana, for all I know. So uh, it, it, I, I appreciate your perspective that Market number one doesn't necessarily mean happiness. Number one, you have some more thoughts on uh, to expound on 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 that on that topic. Well, I tell you what, Frank, I, I want to shout what? out to George Cole in New York. At, at oh, okay, well, at Press Communications. All right, good deal, good yeah. deal. Hey, um, uh, we're going to take our last break real quick, Frank. What we what we typically do at the end of the show um, is we th- we do a, a tip of the week, and you've got a lot of experience both radio and television engineering. And I'd, I'd like you to uh, leave our audience with uh, something really remarkable, uh, some some wise, some wizened advice when oh we come God. back uh, from, from this break. Talking to Frank Martin, he is an L.A. Uh, right now, he's an L.A. broadcast engineer, and he's worked all over the country in uh, different markets, both radio and television, and got some has had some good thoughts on, on these things. Uh, and we got a lot of show notes that are going to go in the show. So if you miss something in the show, Go back and look at the show notes on YouTube or Facebook uh, or my website this week in radiotech.com and uh, and you'll you'll see some good things to to click on. Hey, our show is brought to you in part by our friends at Broadcast Bionics. They make a lot of cool stuff and one of the coolest things is this camera system to broadcast your radio studio uh, either on television or on the internet. You can stream it. Check it out. It's the Camera One system. Camera One from Broadcast Bionics. Designed to bring video to your audio content. Visualizing radio and podcasts for social media. Camera One can automatically create, capture and brand professionally switched video for live streaming or upload, making your production shareable. Control and configure using a web browser on any device. Camera One is available as a 4-camera or 8-camera system using the Blackmagic A10 Mini range, including the A10 Mini Extreme. You can use cameras to suit your studio and your budget. You'll need one camera for a studio wide shot and usually one camera per microphone. A standard multi-channel sound card or IP driver monitors audio from each studio microphone and we work natively with Axia systems. Ideally this will be a post-fader feed from each mic, although you can use pre-fade audio or a mic split if that's all you have available. These audio levels are used to intelligently switch the video feed when each contributor is talking. You can also group microphones together into one shot and use the audio from a mixer's aux bus. You can use Camera One's auto switch feature or disable it and switch using the on-screen buttons or the buttons on the ATEM. Recordings can automatically start when you tell the system you're on the air. This on-air indication can be linked to your studio's red lights via IP or an Avantech Adam GPIO interface. You can quickly browse all the videos that have been automatically created during your broadcast, download them and post. Camera One is a user installable system. You'll need a good spec Windows 10 PC, i7 with plenty of storage and 16 gig of RAM. It's better if this machine isn't used for anything else. Remember, you can control the software in a web browser on another device on your network. Camera One, a thrifty way of creating scroll-stopping video from your show or podcast from Broadcast Bionics. Such cool stuff from Broadcast Bionics, so check it out. Broadcast Bionics at uh, bionics.co.uk. There's a link in the show notes. And remember the virtual rack we talked about with uh, Dan McQuillan back last week? That's a cool product, too. You'll find information about virtual rack at uh, bionics.co.uk. 
Thanks a lot, Broadcast Bionics, for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. So much future of broadcasting is right there. All right, uh, we're going to have a, a tip of the week from Frank Martin in just a minute. I want to give my own tip of the week, and I often don't because we don't have time, but I've got a minute right now. And my tip of the week is uh, something that you've heard of. Uh, some people <laughs> mispronounce it. It's okay. Uh, and that is the SBE Ennis Workshops. Uh, the Ennis Workshops were created back in 1991 through the Ennis Educational Foundation Trust in an effort to bring affordable education to SBE members uh, locally, you know, where, wherever you live. And um, uh, there, we just got done doing one in June in El Paso, had good attendance. Uh, we got three more that are coming up, and I, I'm, I believe I get to speak at all three of these. Um, August 21st, so what, just about a month from right now here in Nashville, uh, we're going to have an NS workshop here. Uh, find out about that at sbe.org. We'll put a link to this in the show notes. Uh, also, September 16th, really cool place. If you're on the East Coast or the Southeast U.S., Jekyll Island, Georgia. Uh, now, not many of us broadcast engineers are golfers, but if you are, oh, my goodness, Jekyll Island is just gorgeous. And uh, that's th that would be a wonderful one to meet you at. Also, October 23rd in Kansas City. He's, and th they're, they're looking at trying to put one together for New York City around the time of the uh, AES and NAB shows in New York City. Not sure if that's going to happen or not. But uh, anyway, Nashville, Jekyll Island, Georgia, and Kansas City. Uh, so we'd look forward to seeing you at one of those. The thing about, about Ennis Workshops is that um, the, the, the educational programs are pretty focused. They're really the best of the best. And I'm not saying I'm the best, but I, it's a good people who are presenting and presenting the latest technical ideas and things that you, we as broadcasters need to know. So I would encourage you to uh, get yourself to an Ennis workshop. SBE.org is the website. That's my tip of the week. I really believe these are, are worthwhile. All right, uh, Frank. Frank Martin's been our guest. Frank, you got a uh, tip of the week, some wisdom doing? to leave. Okay, right. I'll just be philosophical. Uh, oh, and by the way, with SBE, if you are offering uh, your service as a consultant, you want to be on their webpage in their list of consultants. That's my tip. But uh, my tip in, for life is immediacy. Uh, we've got the Burning Man project coming up in about uh, a month and a half. Uh, oh, yeah. I've been doing that oh, yeah. for 12 years. There's about uh, a dozen, a dozen. There's about 50 pirate radio stations out there. Will they in? Oh, my gosh. No, nobody's going to pay any attention to them. Wow. I, they're part 15 after all. Uh, it, and, uh, and anyway, there's 10 principles to Burning Man, which is a gifting. It's devoted to acts of gift giving, de decommodification, radical self-expression, uh, communal efforts, civic responsibility, leaving no trace, participation in the event. But the tip I want is immediacy. Everyone should have just do it now. Get it done. Immediacy is important in life. Don't put it off. Procrastination is bad. That's my tip of the week. That's cool. I had no idea about these 10 principles. Uh, I'll look that up and put them in the show notes. But if you have a link to send me about those I philosophical do. ideas, that would be super to have. And I'll put them in the show notes. We got a heck of a show notes section on, on this episode. And here's the link. Yeah, Burning, Burning Man 10 Principles. I'll send that to you. Well. And there, you, and there's that immediacy right there. And that's I've I've noticed that that with you, Frank. When we talk about something, and uh, and you promise to do something, bam! I mean, twelve seconds later, there it is. So immediacy, yeah, important, yeah. You you live by that. We got to go, uh, Frank or Francis Martin. You'll find him on Facebook. He might friend you if uh, if you're friendly. And, and I, yeah. I host streaming uh, services. If you want to stream live your audio or radio station, Ed Nixon, that's my burner playa name after the dead president Nixon's little brother, Ed, ednixon.com. Oh, we'll put that in the show notes as well. A uh, source for streaming. So I like a, a CDN, Content Distribution Network. This is a server operator at a colo, runs a Unix, and I, I host uh, IceCast, IceCast host for streaming services for audio. Sure. Good deal. All right. It competes uh, with Stream Guys and SecureNet sure. and, you know, sure. et cetera. Good deal. Frank, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for taking an hour of your time. Hey, what and, a, what a and, lot of uh, fun. That's, that's great. And, and, and thanks to your friends at KQBH for uh, letting you take over the control room Royal for a little Mike. while. That's right. All right. Hey, I want 
I got to send a big uh, thanks to Suncast for switching and producing today's show. Suncast, thank you so very much. I appreciate it very much. Uh, I'm not sure who the guest is next week. We'll get it figured out, but we'll hope to see you back next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye.